So, I love to read strange and obscure books, and I think I have found some real diamonds in the rough before. Usually my strategy is just to go on Amazon, search under the name of one of their popular independent publisher clients, and then add a keyword that I think will yield funny results. In the past, I've searched creepypasta characters, the word hacker in the romance category, and now and then I'll just plug in blatantly copyrighted terms just to see if I find any. Anything. Usually, no luck. Usually if you search terms like Ed Sheeran or Darth Vader or Princess Elsa, you're going to find a lot of journals. On Amazon, people love to take a copyrighted image, print it on the cover of a book, leave the interior of the book completely blank, and sell it as a journal. That's illegal! But I doubt they sell that many and nobody's cracking down on it, so it just clogs up all the search results and makes my life so much harder. So this time, I guess I was feeling lucky, and I searched Kylo Ren. I'm scrolling through and it's a million coloring books and journals, and then suddenly, a novel pops up. I get really excited that it's a fanfic, and I click it, and I'm like, wait a second, this isn't a fanfic, this is an original book. What was this doing in the search results for Kylo Ren? But wait a second, I start reading the description, and some things start to sound a little familiar. Black Moon Rising is an original science fiction romance novel set in a universe where humans have taken to the stars and coexist in a vast galaxy with a bunch of humanoid alien species. It's the story of a girl who comes from a nowhere sand planet but possesses mysterious magical powers. She is connected by some kind of magical energy to a black-haired warrior working for a sinister political power. So... Let's be fair here. Science fiction is not exactly the realm of creativity. I'm not saying that it can't be or that it shouldn't be, but it's not always. It has its tropes, it always has, and Star Wars didn't exactly invent the wheel. So if you see evil space empires or laser guns or hyperspace, you don't get to just assume that somebody's ripping off Star Wars. What I'm saying is I'm pretty lenient. And it has to be really egregious to trigger my alarm system. You're probably wondering how egregious this is. There's a little prologue page before the proper book begins, which, um, for no reason at all, I guess I'll present it like this. In the early 24th century, mankind took to the stars. Countless colonies were established on countless habitable planets. The Commonwealth of Planets was forged to maintain peace and civility amongst all races. A thousand years of prosperity and harmony followed, where humans and other life forms lived alongside one another, unified by their core beliefs. Corruption poisons even the calmest waters, though. A group of planetary leaders formed an alliance of their own and deemed the free will of the people to be dangerous. And so the construct was born. Soon the Commonwealth was forced to disband, its leaders executed, its people kidnapped and integrated into the construct army. There are few who refused to bow down to the construct, though. There are still those fighting for equality, liberty, and independence. So, firstly, we have a commonwealth which has enjoyed a thousand years of prosperity and harmony. I will not let this republic that has stood for a thousand years be split in two. The commonwealth is an old republic which has been forced to disband and all of its supporters have gone underground to form some kind of rebellion or resistance against the new evil space government. But again, those are broad concepts. Let's get into the meat of the book. Um, the book begins with a graphic sex scene. Wow, that's just like Star Wars too. I mean, I don't think I can even read, like, certainly not the first sentence or like much of this chapter without getting demonetized. So I'm gonna hope that it's not uh, super important to the story. Okay, fortunately, 
The first chapter is entirely italicized and also entirely a dream or a vision that our main character is having. In her dreams, our protagonist is connected to a dark, evil man, and this apparently happens regularly. I have no words to describe him. Curling his thick, dark, wavy hair around my index finger, I study him intensely. He really is beautiful. Murderer. Assassin. Puppet. He is all of these things, but he is so much more. I allow myself to drift back down into the silent waters of unconsciousness, knowing I won't remember this when I wake. Okay, so these dreams happen regularly, but then she forgets them each time, but then after she's back in the dream, she remembers again that they have happened and knows that she'll forget. Okay, we're like five pages in, I'm gonna worry about this later. So it's time to meet our main character, Reza or Reza? She is an orphan. She actually originally grew up within the Construct, the evil space empire. The Construct laid waste to my home planet and murdered my mother and father. I was taken and shoved into an orphanage on an outpost planet in the middle of nowhere, left to rot with 30 or 40 other children until I reached what the Construct elders termed a useful age. She's then put into a brainwashing program for her entire young life, which they call conditioning. FN2187 reported to my division, was evaluated and sent to reconditioning. I barked out their dictum every time it was required of me. One life, one duty, one construct. Then, puberty. That Molotov cocktail of hormones is enough to send any child crazy, even a child who's been brainwashed. Once more, their coding started to make no sense. Why was it necessary to cleanse the disruptive? Why was sterilization of the masses for the good of us all? I didn't want to murder families in their beds. I didn't want to raise cities to the ground. If all it takes to snap out of it is puberty, how do they have any troops left? That was the first time I saw him. Jas Baylar, the boy with the wild wavy hair and the dark soulful eyes. I'd heard of him, of course. Everyone had. The Construct found him alone on an abandoned planet, living amongst the ruins of an ancient city. Billions of cycles old, he is? After a while, rumors began to spread around the ship. The Construct was training Jas, training him in a way few others were trained, and he was responding. I guess Jas gets special training because he has magical powers, but he is on the same ship as Reza, and their paths cross occasionally. He must have been 17 then, four cycles older than me in his body, but light cycles older in his mind. I didn't see him close again until I was 18, the final day I spent on the starship Invictus. Tell me about that last day, Reza. Tell me again about what happened with Jas Baylar. Across from me in the rusting metal shack I now call home, Seer Darius sits with a nylon mesh mask covering his face. Ever since I found my way to Prius, the Seers have grilled me endlessly about Jas. I don't know why they bother. They're telepaths. They can see inside my head as well as I can see the suns overhead or the rolling sand dunes spreading out for miles and miles in every direction around us. Oh, okay, so she's on a sand planet with rolling dunes and multiple suns. And there are seers, guys in robes who can read minds. I shrug. It was like any other day until it wasn't. We were on our way to the Keptan system. The elders were planning on cleansing a small M-class planet called the Darax. My favorite thing of any sci-fi book is the wacky names. The Invictus was barely in range before a barrage of missiles were launched from the planet's surface. We sustained critical damage to nearly every sector. I seized my opportunity. I ran for the hangar bays and I climbed into one of the emergency escape pods. Jas Baylar sees her from a distance and tries to stop her escape shuttle with telekinetic powers, which I guess he has. She also feels like he's trying to enter her mind, but ultimately he just gives up, I guess, and she leaves. So in this extremely natural natural scene, Reza just happens to be telling her whole backstory to a random character, and um, I guess she escaped the construct a few years ago and is no longer a soldier, and now she lives on a planet whose name I got wrong. I think I said Prius because it looks like Prius, the car. <laughs> um, it's Purius. The Purians, the natives of the planet, they live in tunnels underground. Reza just lives all alone on the surface. Darius straightens up, shifting with meticulously slow, considered movements. He sighs heavily, making his way toward the tattered cloth covering the entrance into my home. 
I know I've been asking these same questions of you for a long time now, child, and I apologize for that, he says over his shoulder. I just had to get the exposition out of the way, so... You know how it is. My people can glimpse into another's mind. We can normally see visions of the future, but ever since you landed here, none of us have been able to see a thing. We cannot reach inside your mind. Our cues from the future have all but disappeared. Uh, not to sound evil, but it kind of sounds like they should have immediately killed her. You are a bright light, blinding all of those who stand too close to you. Darius smiles. Before you arrived here, a small part of your future was witnessed. You and Jas, you are one and the same. A jolt of dread hammers through me. I'm sorry? The same? I don't think so. The same energy that runs through Jas's veins also runs through yours. You can feel it when you close your eyes, Reza. You know it exists there, dormant and sleeping. Something inside me has always been there. And I was awake. I like this setup where they needed to have some kind of prophecy to inform her that she needs to bond with Jas Balar, but the author also must have realized that it makes your story more difficult to navigate if your characters are all seen and all knowing. So they had to write in this thing where these characters had been able to see the future until a point just prior to the story beginning. So now we get a little Jas perspective. Trying not to read someone's mind is like trying not to poke at a broken tooth. Much easier to go into someone's mind and simply pluck out the information you seek instead of wasting hours torturing it out of them. Oh, so he's an interrogator and he uses telepathy to do it. Jas is summoned by his superior, um, a creepy old tall man named Regis. Governor Regis. Governor Regis. He has someone he wishes you to interrogate. Someone? A commonwealth fighter. He was found wandering out in the flatlands. He was dehydrated and delirious, but now he's recovered enough for questioning. On the command deck, Regis is waiting for me with a young man who's bent double at the waist and bleeding from the nose. The commonwealth fighter tries to shift back, but Regis beckons a foot soldier to take him out at the knees. The man hits the deck hard. <laughs> He knows something, Regis says, flicking his hand at the fighter. Get it out of him before he bleeds to death. He marches out of the room. As soon as the doors close behind Regis, I turn to the remaining men and stare at them. My eyes sear into their skin. I continue to stare until they slowly begin to back away and then hurry out of the room. That's a neat trick, the fighter says, groaning. He spits blood out onto the metal grating. Moody teenager wins staring contest. Oh, so the resistance fighter that they recovered from out in the desert, who's now going to be interrogated by the evil warlord boy, um, is quippy and unintimidated. So who talks first? You talk first? I talk first? I'm not a teenager. My voice is flat and even. I wish someone would call Kylo Ren a teenager, like at least one time. Also based on him being called a teenager, I'm starting to doubt the accuracy of our cover model. The fighter laughs. I was told very specifically about what was going to happen today and the story ended with me back in my own bed. And you're prone to believing stories? Only when they're from a seer. Now it's my turn to laugh. Cold, scathing, unfeeling. There are no more seers, fool. They were wiped out cycles ago. The galaxy's free of such nonsense now. I take off my left glove first and then my right. The fighter's eyes widen, but he doesn't shrink away. He screams. I get what I am looking for. Name, Cole Paca, home planet. Perius. Cole, the fighter, looks up at me through wincing, watering eyes and smiles. You probably won't believe this either, he says, but the seer told me we were going to be friends. Good friends. What? You mean like in some kind of redemption arc? I place my hands on him again, needing to see more. There is no glitch, though. There's no fault in his memories. Everything stored within his head is real. The seer is in long robes. Oh, nice, they wear long robes. Telling him of this precise moment. The guards taking Cole and bringing him right here to me. And her. He's seen her. Long brown hair tied back into a complexity of knots and braids. Dark eyes filled with determination and fire. Her lips blushed and parted. Her brow creased in confusion. 
It's Reza. Curious. I've heard of it. The sand that covers every last square click of the planet's surface. Oh, they use clicks. The mantle of the planet's crust is a honeycomb. It's a nowhere planet, unimportant and worthless. She's like me. Of all the people in this godforsaken galaxy, she is the only person I've ever looked in the eye and recognized in some way. All right, I'm gonna move a bit faster through this. We learn that Jas is addicted to something called the light which I guess in this universe is a drug that's just called the light. Forgive me. I feel it again. The pull to the light. The way the light affects me, nothing can compare. My mind wanders to places and planets unknown to me. I'm filled with power. I'm perhaps the strongest during that time, but I'm also incapable of reining myself in. His superiors give it to him in order to control him. Oh, while Cole is mocking Jas, we find out that Jas is wearing black boots, black pants, and a black cape. To my infinite disappointment, there's no indication that he's wearing a mask or a helmet or anything like that, but you know, that might come later. So I guess Jas remembers the dreams too, and he wants to get to Reza, but he can only do that with Cole's help. So Jas is going to have this kind of odd couple adventure where he's going to help break Cole out out of the enemy ship and return him to his desert home planet. Sit down and strap yourself in, I command, stabbing my finger at one of the rear seats. We don't have clearance to leave. As soon as I power up the engines, the flight crew will know something's up. We're going to have to scramble. You'll need a co-pilot then, Cole says. You need a pilot. I need a pilot. The intercom on the control panel buzzes, and Stryker's voice floods the cockpit. Where do you think you're going with that prisoner, Jass? I've never liked Stryker. The man was put in charge of my training by the Order of the Elders, and ever since he's made it his personal mission to make me miserable, keep me chained and compliant. Stryker is a mean, intimidating, high-ranking officer in the Construct's military force, and also in charge of training the different recruits, and apparently differentiates his uniform from other people's uniform with gold metallic highlighting. Anyway, Joss and Cole escape. They damage some of the ships in the hangar bay on their way out. And we're back to Reza. The Seer's subsidy is much like the rest of the settlements on Pirius, a network of underground tunnels and passageways that all twist and turn, interconnecting and diverging over many miles, protected from the persistent sandstorms that buffet the planet's surface. Oh, buffer. Buffer? I don't think the book has that right. I think I had that right. So I think that all Pyrians are seers, and that would mean the terms Pyrian and seer are interchangeable. Uh, it's unclear. Darius lumbers slowly through the passageway ahead of me, seemingly unfazed by the close quarters. They're moving her to live underground, I guess, in anticipation of Jas getting here but um, she's not happy about it because she's claustrophobic. Danger's approaching. You won't be safe out there. It was seen a long time ago before we lost our abilities. The order in which Darius receives and divulges information is very mysterious to me. We stopped having visions months ago, but I'm telling you about it now, and we're going to have danger here soon, which I found out when I still had visions earlier. So you're gonna move underground, now, I won't try and leave. If what you're saying is true and Jas Baylar is on his way to Pirius, I don't want to be out there on my own. The days ahead are uncertain, Darius muses quietly. I mean, they sound kind of conditionally uncertain. Chancellor Paca received many visions of this time before we lost our sight completely. Oh, convenient. But there are many who don't trust in visions that are so old. You are like a lens, Reza. A black, polished lens we can neither see through or around. You conceal the timeline of our future and shield it from us. So, more like a wall then, and, and kind of not like a lens at all. You are like a lens, an opaque lens that's the color lenses never are, which can't be seen through which would be the only function of a lens. Could it be that Jas isn't coming here anymore then? Darius makes a clicking sound at the back of his throat. We sent Cole to retrieve him and guide him here, so we will meet him on our own terms. Plus, Chancellor Paca can still see Jas. Wait, what? His life 
flickers in and out of you, distorted by your lens. So they don't have visions, but they can see Jas, but they can't see him clearly because Reza is a lens, which sometimes distorts things, but most of the time can't be seen through at all. It is like staring into deep water, child. When the water is calm, the bottom of the ocean floor may be seen. The sand, the creatures living within the water, but when the water is no longer calm, stirred up by a ferocious whirlpool, the sand clouds the water is, okay, are we using a lens metaphor or are we using an ocean metaphor? Like, this is bold to put them in the same block of quotation. There are troubled times approaching, very troubled times indeed. The power that explodes forth into the universe when you and Jas Baylar meet in the same location at the same time could be catastrophic for you, for him, for every living creature in this galaxy, then why are they orchestrating it? I don't need to be able to read your mind to know what you're thinking, child, Darius says. You're wondering why we would have our man bring Jas here. I guess Darius is speaking directly to me now. It is not our place to try and redirect a stone once it has started rolling down a hill. We're back to more metaphor. There's a chance, always a chance, that the surge in power that arises from the strange connection between you and Jas could be used for good. Jas Baylor is a black moon hovering over the horizon, Reza. You are a pale moon, stark and silver. There is a chance you will eclipse his his shadow. There is a chance he will eclipse your light. We must see which one of you will rise. Well, based on the title of the book. Okay, so we had a lot of information as well as four different metaphors across two pages. The rules of this universe are completely lost on me. The seers can see the future, except when they can't. And sometimes their view is clear, but other times they're wrong. And Jas is a fish and Reza is a lens or she is a storm in the ocean, or sand, which you can see the bottom through, and the bottom of the ocean is destiny, but Reza is also a moon, and Jas is also a moon. He's a darker, scarier moon, and Reza is a good moon. And you don't eclipse shadow. That's not a thing, is it? That's not how an eclipse works. And if two moons are rising, it's not a question of which one rises, it's which one is in front, right? Okay, anyway, Jas is taking a nap, I guess, while he's in space flight, flying away from the construct, because suddenly we have another dream sequence. Um, so I guess Reza is also asleep somewhere. Is Cole just watching Jas sleep on the spaceship? What's that vibe? So this one is not um, as intense as the first one we saw. They're basically just using this dream scenario to have a little cuddle and reestablish the rules of the dream connection. Um, which is good because we haven't had enough exposition yet. I've been dying for it. Why do you keep taking these memories from me? I don't take them from you. I never have. You just never remember when you wake up. I want you to remember this, I say. Oh, it's Jas's perspective now. Out there, in the waking world, you're terrified of me. Her eyes grow wide, this new revelation taking a while to sink in. What are you going to do when you're finally in front of me, Jas? She asks. We're not going to be friends. I'm going to do anything and everything I can to avoid you at all costs. I shrug one shoulder. We'll cross that bridge when we come to it, but I'm not worried. <laughs> okay, good. So Jas wakes up and pretty much immediately just reiterates that he has no plan, but um, I guess he has to play by the Commonwealth's rules and he can't kill Cole. I felt the seer's intent quite clearly when I ripped through Cole's mind. The string of seers I will need to meet on my road to find the girl, each one only in possession of a snippet of the information I require to find her. Wow, it sounds like he's about to live a similar experience to me reading the beginning of this book. And if one of them has their mind taken against their will, or finds that Cole Paca is dead, they kill themselves, severing the chain. I'll make them pay for inconveniencing me, but when the time is right, and not before. So this is a weird thing about the book, which I haven't addressed yet. I kind of intentionally skipped over it. There is like a weird fixation on characters taking their own lives, or trying to do so, or threatening to do so as a means of leverage. Like I said, I skipped it because, uh, 
it's it's kind of tasteless. They talk about methods, they talk about details, but it is a major factor of Reza's backstory. Not in the sense that you're missing anything by not hearing about it, because I don't think it alters the story. By major, I just mean that it was discussed a lot. It wasn't really in service of anything, uh, but the book brought it up again, so there you go. Reza's point of view. Jaspelar is here. Not close, but somewhere on the planet. I have to fight the extraordinary need inside me to bolt out of my window. Instead, I lean over the side of my cot and throw up. I've never known such a feeling of dread and apprehension before. Not like the one that coils itself into knots inside me, like a pit of snakes right now. Snakes! Snakes are canon! Hold on a second. Snakes! Snakes confirmed. We got- I just truly feel at this point like snakes are the only constant in my life and I have to celebrate the little things. So anyway, it's probably not a great sign that Reza vomits on the floor when her love interest is nearby, but it's possible it's not even nerves. It could just be that she experienced his rough landing through their bond, like she was on some kind of simulator ride. A young seer enters, an apprentice, not quite yet in possession of his sight. You have been summoned, he says softly, avoiding making eye contact with me. The council wishes to speak with you about a matter of great importance. Oh, that's good for them that the seers have a council. I get up, already fully dressed, sliding my feet into my boots, and I follow behind the young apprentice. Darius told me once that his people used to live in cities and towns on the planet's surface, but many generations ago the seers had visions of a terrible catastrophe. They prepared by relocating underground. A number of tables and chairs have been arranged around a central observation deck where three seers stand together, staring up at the grand grand star map overhead. A woman steps out of the shadows on the other side of the room. Chancellor Paka. Her white hair is heavily braided, and her nose is high and unusually narrow for a seer. That's a little loaded. Erica says in her rich, raspy voice, It's good to see you again, Reza. I trust you know why you were summoned? Yes, I know. He, Jas Baylar, has arrived on the planet. You sent your own son to bring him back here? I didn't know Cole was completing solo missions for the Commonwealth. As long as I've known Cole, he's only ever wanted to be a pilot. So we've just met the leader of the Commonwealth, Erica Paka, a woman with braided hair and a raspy voice, and who is the adopted mother figure of a quipping pilot character who just escaped from the Construct's ship. It's not often we're shown conflicting visions of the future, Reza. Before my sight vanished, I saw the people of Pyrian. Pyrian? Their planet is called Pyrius. Whatever. I saw great ships falling from the sky. Construct ships. I saw a black moon floating out in space. <gasps> floating? Was it rising? But then I also saw you here, Reza. And I saw Jas Baylar too. He was helping us. I saw him help us defeat the construct. We're aware of Jas's interest in you, Reza. If he comes here, there's a chance, a very slim chance you might be able to convince him to work with us. So the plan is just basically Reza has to try to redeem Jas, presumably through flirting. The timeline is set. Everything will occur as it's supposed to. There is nothing to fear. And once you have him, I hesitate. Once Jas Baylor arrives here at the Sub-City, what happens then? All three of the seers turn to me. They remain silent for far too long. Eventually Darius speaks, and his words do nothing to comfort me. You will have to be ready to face him then, Reza. You will have to be the one to confront him, and for that, there are things you must learn. My veins are suddenly filled with ice. Learn? And what do you mean, confront him? I like this scene where I believe what's happening is Everyone in the room understands that Reza is basically expected to seduce the bad guy and none of them feel comfortable expressing it in so many words. Meanwhile, Jas and Cole have made a sloppy landing on the planet's surface. My eyes adjust slowly to the burning suns overhead. Two of them. I hadn't noticed this was a binary system on approach to the planet. I wasn't paying attention. Cole Paka stands over me. You know, you could use a haircut, he remarks, clearing his throat. Honestly, I didn't think you'd have hair at all. I expected you to look like an albino raw stick. So uh, honestly, I just skipped a lot. I felt like there was like, it was a lot of stagnation. Jas was immediately tranquilized with a dart. So he's now, I guess, in Pyrian custody. We did have another dream sequence, but 
Uh, so remember when Cole explained or Jas pulled from his thoughts or something that in order to get to Reza, he would have to basically play nice and go through a long chain of talking to people one after the other before he gets there. Um, I kind of thought this was just a long winded explanation as to why he couldn't kill Cole and, and quickly they would just skip to him being here. Uh, but no, it turns out they intend to, I guess, play out all of those conversations, which is just kind of filler and not necessary for me to read out loud. I'm like hyper aware of this cow lick happening on the back of my head, but unaware of how to fix it, so it's just gonna live there. Well, that was a revelation. So we're back to Reza. I can't do this. I can't. I just... I'm not who you think I am. I can't force people to bend to my will. I'm just a girl who ran away from the construct. The galaxy's full of people who ran away from the construct. Why should I be any different? Oh, so maybe they do just lose a lot of soldiers to puberty. Darius spins the staff he's holding around in his hand. Other people aren't special simply because they aren't special. You're special simply because you are. I don't like that as far as sage wisdom goes. While you're just a girl, a simple girl, there's something hibernating within you that makes you remarkable. We need to awaken those skills and fast. Ah, so they need to awaken some kind of- He's already struck me with his staff twice on left side and once on my right. I'm going to be black and blue and covered in bruises by the end of the day. Two days ago, I spent a solid 18 hours with Erica, practicing how to defend my mind. A difficult task, since Erica can't read me in the first place. And so I left her sparse library feeling dissatisfied and anxious, unsure if her training will actually accomplish anything when the time comes. Oh my god. These people's plan is so bad in every way that it can be. I can block most of Darius's attacks, but it takes concentration to try and maintain the mental guard Erica taught me how to build at the same time. Facing someone like Jas Balar, someone who's been endlessly trained and honed into a deadly weapon, I am going to die. Oh, I forgot nobody's told poor Reza that she's in a romance novel yet. You don't have to fight Balar, Darius informs me. However... However, I've created something for you. A way out. A safeguard, in case the sand does end up shifting beneath our feet. Oh, another sand metaphor. But this time, I think not sand that's in the ocean. Darius reaches into his robes and withdraws something. He opens his fist, and in his palm, a small black capsule. Oh, I thought it was a lightsaber hilt or something, but um, it's actually a toxic capsule. Night creeper, he says gravely. Incredibly hard to come by, even harder to diagnose, impossible to cure. You swallow this and there's no coming back for you, child. An awful sense of foreboding digs its claws into my back. If it's so deadly, how is it possibly meant to keep me safe? Baylar's hungry for something. You must have something he needs, Darius says. But how can he claim it from you if you're no longer alive? Okay. Two things. One, what did I just say about this book's weird fascination with characters taking their own lives as some kind of power move? Two, I thought this plan couldn't be any less of a plan, but it somehow got worse. So back to Jas Baylar, he is now meeting with another person in the chain so he can get to where Reza is. And in case the plan wasn't convoluted enough, it changes again and Jas is now going to a different location. It doesn't change the stakes at all. It's just a weird thing that happens, and that's life, man. We're met at the first sector by another chancellor, this time Cole's own mother. She turns her smile on me, her eyes crinkling at the corners. I'm very glad you're here, Jas. I've been waiting a long time to meet you. She places a hand on my shoulder, benevolence and kindness shining from her. I saw what was going to happen here before I was blinded to the universe. It made me hopeful. I've been looking forward to this day for seven cycles. I would be less uncomfortable right now if she were making threats to my life instead of looking at me like I am her own personal savior. I'm not sure what you saw, but time must have warped your visions, Chancellor. I'm here for Reza, Erica. Nothing more, nothing less. She promised me an audience. She also promised me she'd submit herself to me. The moment I discovered she wasn't true to her word, when did she promise these things? Oh, to be fair, it could have been in the dream sequence that I skipped. Seems to me like the Pyrians are making a lot of promises, but unless he's trying to hold something that occurred in a dream to be a promise in the real world, 
And in that case, how is he gonna sell that to these people that don't know about the dreams? Then like, where is he coming from? Raze is an honest person. She keeps her promises. She also swore she'd take her own life if you didn't conduct yourself civilly. You have no reason to doubt her. She's right, I don't. I knew she meant it. Didn't see it as an act of cowardice. It was an act of bravery on her part, where she took control back from the construct. What is with these people? What is with this author is my real question. I already said I was uncomfortable with how often this theme crops up, but do we really need a bit of dialogue where the hunky romantic lead contemplates how he believes Reza would take the poison capsule and that in fact he would respect her for it? It just seems irresponsible. Reza's point of view. My heart's stumbling around the inside of my chest. I stand on the other side of the door, my head bowed, the tips of my fingers numb. If I don't manage to make some sort of headway here with Jas, the construct will arrive in time for the next double eclipse, and they'll eradicate this outpost. There will be so much death and destruction. Jas will become unstoppable force of evil in the galaxy. Another typo. Jas will rise to power and madness. He won't let them kill me. He'll harness the energy inside me and use it to control me. I'll be his slave, doomed to carry out his bidding, trapped inside my own body, unable to prevent the death that will befall so many worlds. I will kill over and over again, and I'll be unable to look away. Okay, um, where is she getting any of this? Like, literally all of that was news to me. I did not know that harnessing her energy was within his power, or... I Cole, my friend for the last seven cycles, places a hand on my back, rubbing in small circles. I like how we've seen no interaction between these characters, and this is their way of, like, showing us seven years of friendship. She just goes, he's been my friend for seven years, and we're supposed to go, oh, okay. I'm on board. I can come in with you if you like, he offers. I've kind of gotten used to him over the last few days. There's a trick to dealing with him. Don't show him your fear. He's like a blood horse. If he knows you're intimidated by him, he'll discount you right out of hand. Oh, that is like a blood horse. Honestly, I really don't mind coming in with you, if you like. Cole's kind smile says he means it. I'll be okay, I think, I hope. I take a deep breath, hand pressed lightly on the ready room's access panel. Oh, cool, they open their doors using access panels. A boy. No, a man sits in a chair. He's alone. His mop of dark hair waves wildly all over the place, thick and untamable. His eyes are dark, too. Dark brown like molten chocolate, flecked with gold and caramel, warm, alive very intense. Beneath his eyes, a long, arrow straight nose and full lips that are pressed together. His cheekbones are high, higher than they normally would be on a boy, but they somehow suit him. His face is all angles, severe yet soft at the same time. You're exactly as I remember, Jess says quietly. Your hair, your eyes, your freckles, that birthmark on your shoulder. He points to the small mark that indeed sits upon my right shoulder. You look nothing like I remember, I fire back. I seem to recall being terrified of you on that ship. You look fairly harmless to me now, though. It's foolish to tell him he looks harmless. His shoulders are broad, his chest packed with muscle, his hands resting in front of him on the table's surface, palm down, are strong and capable. His dark eyes are sharp and focused, studying and assessing. You're still the construct's plaything. You still hurt people and cause them to suffer. You're a faceless monster, a night terror, a dark ghost. Jas's eyes glitter with some unknown emotion. He shrugs his right shoulder only. As you say. And you called me a monster. You are a monster. Yes, I am. Are you trying to claim my energy? Is that it? You've gone to all this trouble to find me because you want to drain me until I'm dead? Yeah, she's really on the him stealing her energy thing. I don't really know where it came from. Yes, I'm interested in your energy, he confesses. I don't want to drain it from you, though. I'm far more interested in what could be accomplished if we were to combine our energies together, voluntarily. I want you to join me. We can rule together and bring a new order to the galaxy. You see, your mind has high walls, Reza, he tells me airily, but I can still get inside, stubborn though you are. Your power's too raw, untamed and untrained. She is strong with the Force, untrained but stronger than she knows. Reza flees in, um, I guess discomfort. And then Erica shows up and just starts berating her about the 
jazz a ship, not being canon yet. You need to go back in there. You need to convince him. Did you try and enter his mind like we practiced? Erica paces up and down beneath the canopy of stars projected high overhead on the cavern's roof, wringing her hands. There's so little time, Reza. We're working against the clock. I saw the attack happening during a double eclipse. The next double eclipse to occur takes place in less than a month. I know this is far from easy, but the galaxy hangs in the balance. So I'm just going to say it. This book has been 80% characters expositing and explaining the consequences of things they need to do. And 15% Jas and Reza interacting sexily in dreams. And like 5% Jas and Reza interacting in real life. I'm sorry, I know what a daunting task this must seem, Reza. I know you're trying to meet the challenges we've set you head on. I apologize for the burden we've placed on your shoulders. This is all... A lot. Wow, Erica's powers must be back because she just read my mind. Reza is in another dream. We never see the characters going to bed. They just manifest in dreams and we go, oh, they must be asleep. I have sand in my eyes. A storm is building on the horizon and for some reason I'm walking toward it. My shirt is slick with sweat, my muscles protesting as I steadily climb up the tallest dune I have ever seen. I don't drink, I don't pause, I don't rest. I push onward through the sand, wrapping my head in a scarf as the winds start to pick up and grains of sand begin to buffet my face. Oh, buffet? Are you sure it's not, a uh, buffering your face? Took you long enough, a voice says. I don't panic when Jas rises. My fear is there, like a fire raging beneath a blanket, and yet I don't really feel it. It comes back to me slowly. All of the times I've met with him like this before, so many times, he's kissed me, he's held me, he's... Oh, okay. I have to say, every time something sexually explicit happens, or the characters even cuss, I feel newly surprised, because otherwise this book puts out such strong YA novel energy. You must have thought it was hilarious sitting there across from me in that room, with me not remembering any of this. I mutter, not particularly. I wanted to touch you. I wanted to kiss you. You'd have had me shot. I lift my chin in defiance, staring right back at him, refusing to look away. I'm an orphan. I have no heritage, no home. I have no wealth and no power. You have no place in this story. You come from nothing. You're nothing. But it would be a mistake to underestimate me. I fight hard when I'm backed into a corner. A flicker of amusement passes over his face. I've entertained him. But who said anything about fighting? I'm no fool, Jas. You want my energy. I feel like this energy stealing concept was probably decided early on in the author's mind, like she knew it was there, and then perhaps just forgot to include it in this draft, or at least to set it up. And now we're just seeing the remnants of it later in the story, and we don't know where Reza got this idea. She hasn't seen Jas do this to anyone. We haven't heard mention of it. Reza didn't even understand that she wasn't completely normal until like a week ago when Darius told her she's just been training to use her powers. So I don't know how she would suddenly reframe it into the idea that she has energy, that it can be stolen, and that Jas wants to steal it, and that that's a power that he has. You're a murderer. You've killed hundreds of people. Murderous snake. Jas smiles an odd, twisted smile that contorts his features. There will always be those with power and those without it. So can we talk a minute about these dreams? Jas always remembers them when he wakes up, but Reza never does. But when Reza enters the dream, she begins to remember the previous dreams, but it takes a minute, except in some dreams, like the one we've just seen, she does remember eventually that there have been other dreams, and I suppose she remembers the events from within those dreams, but she doesn't empathize with her mindset and doesn't understand why she was in love with him in the other dreams. Almost as if she's just a new person being informed of old events without living through them. And so in those dreams, she is immediately distrustful of Jas. But in other dreams, she kind of picks up where she's left off and is just his loving girlfriend. Um, but regardless, she remembers nothing when she wakes up and then it's like back to square one the next time. Also, it's always confusing when the dreams begin because they happen about every other chapter and you never see the characters actually going to bed or understand how the story got from where it was in the last scene to the characters sleeping peacefully in a bed because this has been a very tumultuous story so far. Jas wakes up in a guest room, I guess, that they've 
given him. The dream was different this time, hard to initiate, and then out of control. I would have liked to stay longer, but her retreat made it impossible to hold the strands of the dream state together without my own mind buckling under the strain. Now that we're in such close proximity, she's much stronger than she knows. Stronger than she knows. I lie in the dark for an hour or more, listening to the dreams of the people sleeping close by, marveling at how obliviously they traipse through the experience, barely even participating in the journey their subconscious takes them on. Things could be so different for them. Revenge could be won. Success could be achieved. Anger could be assuaged. Sexual desires could be fulfilled. And yet none of these people are aware that they can take the reins and control their nighttime misadventures. Jass is just every dude on Reddit who wants to brag about how he lucid dreamed one time. After a while, I sense an irregularity amongst all the slumbering minds. Someone else is awake. I throw the sheets back on my cot. I pull my clothes on and shove my feet inside my boots. Eventually, my walk leads me to a dark, dry cavern, just like the old chapel back on the Nexus. This place feels sacred. They called this the Reckoning Hall, a voice says. The man who's been waiting for me steps into vision, a long staff propped gracefully over one shoulder. So it's Darius. This is his first scene with Jas, and he immediately observes that Jas is in the early stages of light withdrawal. Jas's source of the light is back at the construct, so now that he's been away, it's starting to take a toll on him. And he tried to bring some of the light with him, but he lost his bag in the shipwreck. My hands are trembling. My mind has been so filled with thoughts of Reza that it's been relatively easy to put aside my body's increasing need for light. I won't be able to ignore it soon, though. My addiction will come calling, and I'll have to pay heed to it. Darius smirks. Would you consider yourself a man of honor, Jas? he asks. I suppose so, I say. Whatever that's worth. It's worth a lot down here. Your word, your honor, is your only currency. I don't need currency down here, stranger. I can take whatever I want. You know I can take whatever I want. I can help you. I'm an expert healer. There isn't a compound in this galaxy I can't cure you of. It'll take a number of days, and you'll have to be compliant, but it can be done. You'll be free of the yoke hanging around your neck. And all I ask in return... His words have jarred me, thrown me, made me shut down. I don't want his help. I don't need it. I can handle this on my own. I should rip his head off his shoulders right where he stands. I'm vibrating, jittering out of control. Perhaps you're not ready to have this conversation after all, Darius says softly. He reaches out and places a hand on my shoulder. I'm sure I'll see you soon, he tells me. See you around, kid. Darius seems to waver a little, and then... The reckoning hall is melting. I throw a hand out, trying to grapple hold of Darius' staff again, but my fingers grasp at thin air. Darius is gone. I'm alone in the blackness, and I can't move. I jolt awake with a start, my heart hammering like a piston inside my ribcage. Hells. I wipe the sweat from my brow with the already soaked sheet that covers me. I believed I'd climbed out of my bed and gone to Darius. I believed I'd been awake. How could he be that strong? The anger that rises up and storms inside me is unparalleled. He thinks about how he hates being here and wants to just grab Reza and go. I could lock her out of her own body, make sure she can't move a muscle, an inch, can't even blink her eyes. All of that is within my power. But he won't because he has a crush on Reza and she'd be mad if he did that. Reza says, I wake to the sound of bells and the sensation of a thousand ton weight pressing down on my chest. The dream comes flooding back to me and then, many more dreams. Many, many more. What the... I've been to him before. For... Oh, no. It's been this way for cycles. They call years cycles, by the way. A wall of horror slams into me when I remember our past exchanges. As each dream comes jolting back to me, I want to die. I have no idea why this is happening now. I just ran over the whole dream dynamic in my head, and that was all useless because the dreams are, I guess, over now, and she just remembers everything. I can't deny that, like... This is funny, what's happening? But why? Like, why have her not remember in the first place if she's going to then start to remember everything 
after only one confrontation in real life where she didn't remember. It didn't really contribute any tension because it ended so quickly. Anyway, when Reza leaves her room, everybody in the underground city is freaking out and running through the halls. The sound of running boots and strained voices flood the hallway outside my room as a handful of people hurry by. A hundred bodies are packed tightly together, where the sides of the tunnel form a bottleneck, and a wailing woman with a child in her arms collapses to the ground, disappearing beneath the crush. Stop, I scream. Someone fell. Someone went down. Wait your turn. We'll all get through it if you just wait. When he looks at me, his eyes glaze over, and he releases me, though, shaking his hand out. His mouth hangs open slack, and he falls still. So Reza appears to have just done a Jedi mind trick on this guy which I guess is part of the power set. We still haven't gotten an explanation as to why, but Reza is suggested to be claustrophobic, so this is a bad situation for her. Everybody's packed in the tunnel. It could become dangerous. Fortunately, she runs into Jas, who uh, they still act really confrontational toward each other, and um, so her remembering the dreams didn't really change anything. I guess that's just because, like, it's hotter if they argue. Despite her now remembering that they've been brain dating for like seven years, Jas blinks down at me. He isn't classically handsome by any stretch of the imagination, but the knife straight, strong line of his nose lends his features solidity. The high, pronounced line of his cheekbones tempers that, offering a softness in return. His full mouth is expressive, the cupid's bow that forms his upper lip perfect in its line, and his eyes, so mercurial and volatile, calm one moment, wild and extreme in their beauty the next, are more than a little distracting. He's fascinating to look at, whatever his mood, but worryingly, he is at his most breathtaking when he's angry. I I like how this is in the middle of like kind of an action scene and we're just getting like our third very long paragraph describing his hotness to us as though she's never laid eyes on him before. People of Pirius, we're grateful you have been able to join us here today. We are aware that this event wasn't supposed to happen for another six days. However, as you know, the timeline of the West Sector developed rather dramatically last night. Darius stands on the dais, a mournful look on his face. The cardiac failure Erica and many of her close friends foresaw in her future a long time ago did not come to pass. At some point last night, someone broke into Erica's rooms and stabbed her in the stomach with a ceremonial blade. She didn't seek help. She used the minutes she had left to write a letter to her son, followed by a letter to you, her people. Wait, what? An assassin stabbed Erica literally six days before she had foreseen her own death anyway. And while she was bleeding out, she had time to sit down and pen multiple letters, not one, but two letters. And the assassin, I guess, just didn't stab her again. He just stabbed her once and then left without checking to make sure she was going to die. And she did not bother to include in either of those letters the identity of her attacker. And for that matter, if she knew she was going to die in six days, shouldn't she have just already written the letters? Cole stands in the center of the dais and carefully tears open the small white scroll of people? The small white scroll of people he's holding in his hands. Found another typo. Friends, I have anticipated the arrival of this day for half a lifetime. I've had a long time to consider the words I will leave behind to guide you, and yet now, at the hour of my death, they seem insufficient. For the past 43 cycles, it has been my- how long is this letter? Okay, this letter is two pages long. Darius steps forward and raises his hand, urging the Pyrians to calm themselves. Since Chancellor Paca departed us earlier than expected, we've not had time to accept nominations for her successor. What? Again, she only died six days early. Really cutting it down to the wire there, aren't you guys? Somebody's like, Chancellor Farron! But we're vaguely informed that Chancellor Farron is evil? In part because his name is Chancellor Farron, and that just sounds evil. But then Darius is like, no, he's not eligible to run anyway, he already runs another sector, and it's like, oh, okay. Cole Paca, Paca is going to run for office, and okay, here's the deal. I am trying to engage with this book on its own terms, and even within the context of the book, I could not care less who gets to be Chancellor 
of Pirius. We are now over halfway. Our power couple have not even kissed in real life yet, and they haven't even left the planet to be in the proximity of Snoke, who I assume they have to kill for this story to conclude because that's the big bad guy, and by Snoke I mean Regis. Basically at this point I'm accepting that this is clearly a book one in a series because there's too much they haven't touched yet but I'm not happy about it. Joss and Reza reconvene in another scene that was directly after the previous scene. Time just means nothing in this book. Perhaps she's been able to sense the agony burning inside me. Perhaps she's been able to detect just how much I've been suffering over the past two days from the light withdrawal. I look at Reza and she gives me a knowing look that makes my teeth hurt. It's a rude awakening that my secrets might not be safe. I haven't had to erect high walls around my mind. For as long as I've served the construct, no one has been capable of looking inside my head. The elders assumed I was the only person left in the galaxy capable of such a thing. Wait, but seers can look into people's minds and there's a whole planet of them. Or I guess they can't now because Reza's around. Actually, I have this new headcanon that that's a coordinated lie that they're all as a society telling to Reza. Like if an alien came to Earth, I would totally be like, oh yeah, we all knew you were coming. Usually humans can see the future and read minds and fly, but for some reason when you're here, it doesn't work. Oh, that's crazy, you must be blocking us. I turn my attention to Reza. What do you remember of your home planet? She blinks at me, confused. I remember nothing. I was only seven when the construct... The people. What do you know about them? Do you want to know the truth about your parents? Or have you always known? Are you just hidden it away? You know the truth. Raza's face crumples. I don't know. Nothing, really. Raza says the only thing she remembers about her people is that every seven years they worshipped a blood son. What a good lead. I lean across the table, focusing all of my attention on Reza. Her hair is sandy brown, but more interesting than that, shot through with gold and silver, as if it's woven from fine, precious metals. Her long, wispy fringe is very pale, bleached by the suns, though it looks as though it's been kissed by moonlight instead. The freckles scattered across the slender bridge of her nose are delicate and faint, but they lend her a girlish quality that makes her look younger than she really is. This isn't going anywhere, Cole says. Thank you, Cole. Go on, then, I tell him, just Gesturing to the door with a flick of my wrist. We'll continue on without you. I'm sure Reza will give you the cliff notes once you- Wait a second. Wait, wait. The cliff notes? Is cliff notes canon in the Black Moon Rising universe? They have dune dogs, raw sticks, and blood horses, but they also have snakes and cliff notes. Is the name of the cliff notes brand, like, based on a military expression? Like, you get down from the cliff and they're like, Give me the report. Give me your cliff notes. <laughs> I'm gonna look it up. Okay, I looked it up and no, cliff notes are called cliff notes because the guy that founded it was named Clifton and they were his notes. So I guess Clifton Hillegas of Nebraska is canon to the Black Moon Rising universe. Cole spins around and heads for the door, obviously seething. Angling her head and tilting her chin, there's a defiant fire burning inside Reza as she stares me down. Okay, we're alone. How about we stop with the games? Why are you asking me about my home planet? You and I are more alike than I first thought. This connection between us, it's not some random accidental thing. It's far more than that. I've had my theories about Reza for a very long time now, but verifying them has turned my head upside down. We're not just similar. It's no miracle that you can resist me where others can't. Your ability to reach down the tether that connects us in the same way I can is no fluke. We are the same, Reza. We both hail from the same planet. We are the last remaining true survivors of Earth. I mean... Of course, because those are all things earthlings can do. You were there the whole time, he whispers softly. You were here, right underneath my nose. I wasn't alone. I wasn't alone. You're not alone. Neither are you. With that, he topples sideways from his chair, eyes rolling back into his head completely out cold. Okay, so Jas has collapsed from light withdrawal and he gets taken to Darius who uh, starts treating him for it, which I think just entails like 
putting an IV drip in his arm and waiting for him to sleep it off. So that plot detour didn't really matter either. I mean, it did eat up several chapters and uh, there was a dream sequence in the middle, so. You also might recall that Darius had offered to treat him for this earlier in exchange for something and Jas neither found out what that thing was nor agreed to the deal, but that also didn't matter because Darius is just helping him now anyway. Oh, oh, this is important. Um, Evil Chancellor Farron, who wasn't eligible to run for office, is just running for office anyway. And only the top brass know that Jas Baylar is Jas Baylar. Everyone else just thinks he's like some guy that's visiting, I guess. So Reza reads Chancellor Farron's mind to discover that for some reason, Chancellor Farron hates Jas and wants to reveal his identity. And he's decided he's going to do that in his victory speech if he wins the election. It's a lot of ifs, like why doesn't he just do it if he wants to do it? Why hasn't he done it sooner? But whatever, we need to add some stakes to this election somehow. Seems like kind of a dumb way to use your victory speech though, like that's your time. It should be about you. And then Farron wins the election, obviously. I thought Farron couldn't legitimately win, I hissed to Darius. He can't, he answers. At least he shouldn't be able to. But in this case, it looks like the people have spoken. Oh, cool. What is their government? Who's running the place? Why are all their plans so bad? Why don't any of their laws matter? I hold my breath waiting for Farron to speak the words that will spell disaster for these people, to tell the assembly that they have had Jas Baylar in their midst for nearly two weeks now. Two weeks? You know what, fine. I could stop him. I wouldn't have to do it with my hands, tackling him and dragging him from the dais. I could slip oh so quietly into his mind, and I could prevent him from even forming the words. Better yet, I could remove the knowledge that Jas is even here at all. You should do that. Invading someone's mind goes against everything I believe in. But I have to try. I reach out with my mind, searching, hunting for a way inside Farron's mind. I haven't got the first clue how to proceed. I fumble blindly, hunting for the information I need to steal from the new Chancellor of the First Sector. His dark eyes glaze over and he takes an unsteady step backward, looking around the hall. He's discovered me. So Reza fails, but then that doesn't matter because Jas, standing elsewhere in the crowd, now out of his sick bed, I guess, um, just does it for her, so it's fine. Reza fumbles around inside Farron's head, essentially tripping all over the furniture, and that's when Farron senses her. Resolve pours off him in waves. As Chancellor of the Sector, he can have her cast out, banished. He wants to make her suffer for trying to invade his mind, though. He wants to make her pay before sending her out to die of thirst on the surface. I react. I don't even think about it. I barge my way into Farron's head, and the action is as simple as opening up a door. I've done nothing to camouflage myself. I want him to know I'm inside his head, and I want him to understand. I can end his life right now if I want to. I could force him to stop breathing, and he would suffocate in front of everyone. They wouldn't be able to save him. They wouldn't be able to push the oxygen into his lungs if I didn't allow it. Oh, that's a unique uh, application for his power of telekinesis. So then, even though he thinks all that, instead of wiping Farron's mind or killing him, Jas decides to just go inside his mind so he knows that he could and then back off. You know, the safest way to deal with your enemies, uh, making them feel backed into a corner and afraid of you and uh, making them hate you more and then doing nothing to stop them from being a threat in the future. A uh, new Reza chapter, it's night I guess, and for once we aren't getting a shared dream sequence. I can feel that he is awake. What are you doing? The words are marred, slightly distorted, but I hear them perfectly well inside my head. Jas, out, get out of my head. Get out of my head. Oh, okay, so this is like a waking version of the shared dream, so it's kind of the same thing. I need sleep, Jas, please. Don't do this again. You're just as restless as I am. You can feel it too. I feel it too. The connection falls dead like a damaged comms radio, blasting nothing but quiet static through its speakers. Oh, a comms radio. Rap, rap, rap. I freeze. The gentle knocking was quiet, but it might as well have been a series of deafening explosions. I know who it is. It better be Jas laying down a sick beat in the hallway. He stands there wearing a pair of those loose black pants and nothing else. His chest is bare. His feet are bare. His hair is rumpled, curling everywhere in a shock of dark waves that frame his face in the most fascinating, distracting way. He towers over me. The soft, subdued light pours over Jas's shoulders and down his right arm like honey, turning his pale skin to gold. I don't look at his chest 
chest. I don't look at the beautifully carved muscle or the defined lines that mark out each of his abs. You came half naked on purpose. The man looks darned good in the plain black shirts he's been wearing, but he's something else without them. His arms are corded and powerful, muscle knitted around even more muscle. He would probably be a formidable foe even if he didn't possess the ability to control people's thoughts and actions. I feel like at this point, you need to formally have like an MLA citation of Ryan Johnson in your book before you can proceed. What follows is um, not really within my PG YouTube parameters, so. I never knew a person could be so conflicted. Being with Jass is like drowning and floating off into oblivion all at once. It's burning up and freezing. I can't wrap my head around it. I know I shouldn't want him, but every cell in my body screams otherwise. It. Oh, maybe not. Jas's hair tumbles into my face as he leans down to kiss me, and my heart races away from me. He's... oh, nope. Okay. This is not what the force is for, you guys. Okay, so Reza wakes up the next morning. Um, Jas is already gone somewhere. Hammering on the door. Loud, abrasive, annoying. Cole, what a pleasant surprise. The man stands on the other side of the door, hair all must on one side, presumably from where he was sleeping on it. Jas didn't sleep in his bed last night. Cole rushes out. His bed was untouched. His shirt was lying on the floor, along with the rest of his clothes. My cheeks are on fire and the burn is creeping down my neck. <laughs> he hasn't left the sub city, I say, swallowing hard. Okay, so Reza just miraculously avoids having to explain what happened last night. Cole says that Chancellor Farron is like on the warpath now that he's in charge and that they're not safe. We have to find Jas, Cole says, rubbing his hands over his face. I never thought I'd say this, but maybe it's better if we give Farron what he wants. If we leave, no one will come to any harm. I love that, like, wh why now? And again, if they were going to just call it a wash and leave, why did the election, or in fact most of the book, matter at all? But I think what's really happening is the author is like, deciding that it's time to wrap this story up. So she's like, okay, get him off planet. We locate him in the communications hall alone, which is strange. Jas sits at the control desk at the very front of the hall, head bent over the screen. Cole hurries across the hall and stands behind Jas, peering over his shoulder. What have you done to the screen? That's not a standard readout. I fixed it, improved it. Now you can track in hyperspace. Jas huffs heavily down his nose as he finally turns his gaze to me. You look tired, didn't you sleep well? <laughs> I'm fairly confident my blush covers my whole body at this point. Still haven't mastered the art of lying, I see, he muses. You could learn a thing or two from me, if you'd only spend some more time with me. You need a teacher! I could show you the ways of the Force! Darius refuses to come with us. He claims he needs to stay in order to keep Farron in line. Cool, I'm glad that all happened off screen. It sounds like it wasn't important at all. The people of Pirius rarely leave the surface of the planet, so it's a miracle Cole even managed to salvage the rusting, dented, beat up vessel. The Oraxis' thrusters are filled with sand, and the ancient paint job is so sandblasted and eroded that it's impossible to tell what colors originally marked the metalwork. Wow, it sounds like a piece of junk. That thing will never get us through the atmosphere, Jas says bluntly. He kicks at the hole with the toe of his boot. I've seen some junkers in my time, but this is beyond the pale. A little over an hour into our flight, Cole receives a transmission from the surface of Pirius. Notice. Henceforth, the ship Oraxis and its occupants will not be granted permissions to port at Pirius. Construct leaders have been informed of Jas Baylar's last known whereabouts. We assume they will be tracking your vessel shortly. Grand Elder Farron. I scan the message twice over just to make sure I'm reading it right. Grand Elder Farron? Since when does Pirius have a Grand Elder? Cole glares at the pixels in front of him, utterly dumbstruck. Not for centuries. Before the subsidy was divided up and a duly appointed seer took over administration of each sector, only one seer ruled the entire city, a Grand Elder. It was later decided that a council of leaders would prevent corruption and aid in diplomacy efforts between the Coraline families spread across the subsidy, though. That was a long time ago. Cool. I'm glad we're finding out this important backstory of Pirius on page 328. Also, I've noticed the author frequently does a thing where characters will say a line of dialogue and it will end with comma though. And it happens in narration and across the speech patterns of many different characters. So 
you know, that's a thing that like an editor would have seen. But Cole speculates that Darius is probably now a political prisoner and possibly going to be killed. So uh, cool, Darius. Good job staying behind and keeping Farron in line. A plus plan on your part. Will Regis be able to track the Oraxis through hyperspace? I ask. <laughs> Sorry, that's a good sentence. Bile rises to the back of my throat at the very thought of the construct. The Nexus has been a ground base since its completion, but it does have flight capabilities. No doubt a solid portion of its structure would be heavily damaged by uprooting it from its foundations on Deirax. But Regis wouldn't give that a second thought if Stryker was whispering sweet nothings into his ear about victory. Nice. Uh, some more exposition about a ship uh, that's a large ground base but can turn into a flying vessel, but that that is unprecedented. So I'm sure that will never come back and we'll never see that happen. They will find us. From the back of the ship, Jas raises his voice. I thought he'd gone into the back sleeping quarters and passed out, considering how quiet he's been. No, Reza, we'd have a dream chapter if that happened. What kind of weapon system does this ship have? I asked. None. This craft was used solely for leisure tours, not fighting. Oh my god, even Star Tours has guns on the vehicles. Don't they have space pirates in this universe? Jas sighs, getting to his feet. He reaches into his pocket and draws something out, tossing it to Cole. Something small, black, and cylindrical. <laughs> Is it just another poison capsule? A data stick. Oh, huh. You don't say a data stick. Plug the coordinates stored on there into the nav systems. They'll take us somewhere close somewhere safe. Cole angles his sensor array, and on it a sea of construct targets, all headed our way. The Nexus, he says grimly. They didn't just bring out the big guns, they brought out their biggest. So yeah, you remember like two pages ago when they set up that the large base, the Nexus, was also a ship, and that it could leave its foundation? Yeah, I'm, I'm shocked too that it came back around. And so soon as well. They're not following, Cole shouts over the roar of the ship's engines. Oh no, wait, yes they are. Cole, of course they're following. I curve my hands around Reza's face, lifting her chin so that she's looking up at me. She was angry before, tense and stressed. Now she's just afraid. It's going to be all right. Her eyes are bright, wide, but unafraid. Ah! Uh? Can you take it from me? She replies. Can you take all of the energy from me and still leave me alive? Even if it is possible for me to siphon energy from Reza, I know with a certainty that I wouldn't be able to take it all. There'd be nothing left. I shake my head. It doesn't matter. I won't do it. Isn't that why you chase me down? Your desire for more power? If I offer it freely, you'll be unstoppable. You'll be able to put an end to Regis and Stryker once and for all. Okay, gonna run down my questions really quick. One, has Jas ever siphoned power from anyone before to know that that is a thing he can do? Two, how did Reza become convinced of this concept? Three, how does he know he'd have to take it all? Once you engage a hyperdrive and breach faster than light travel, you remain at a constant speed until you disengage the drive. If we entered hyperspace before the construct, the distance between us should remain the same until one or both of us drop back into normal space. The Construct have somehow developed a technology far beyond that of hyperdrive. How long until we reach our target? I yell. Four minutes, 37 seconds. Can you open the cargo bay doors with the drives engaged? Cole looks at me like I've lost my mind. Hell no! The atmosphere will be ripped straight out of the ship. None of the seals will hold under such a drastic pressure change, and at these speeds the ship will break apart. I grind my teeth together. Never mind. When I give you the command, you open them. I'll keep us alive. I point to the tower of crates stacked in the cargo hold. The same crates I was sitting on just now. Open them up. Take the lids of five of them at least. Reza does what I've asked. She falters when she rips the lid off the first crate and she sees what's inside. Glowing blue plasma shells designed for the sole purpose of refilling phase rifles, at least a hundred of them. Very safe when in their sealed cartridges, but when exposed to immense heat and pressure. Wait, so if this is a pleasure cruise and it's not even equipped with like external cannons, why does it just happen to be carrying hundreds of guns? I open up the red box on the wall and rifle through its contents until I find what I'm looking for. A med scanner. The smallest electrical charge. That's all I need. The med scanner will be enough to provide the spark, and the plasma shells will do the rest. All these MacGyvering pieces might have been more interesting if they had been mentioned even in passing at any time before. When I tell you, open the cargo hold doors. I'll send the crates and the med scanner out into the path of the Nexus. Once they're clear of us, I'll trigger the scanner. Hopefully the blast will be closer to the Nexus than it is to us. 
Take a deep breath, I yell. Once the doors are open, the oxygen inside the ship will evacuate. Don't try and hold the breath. If you do, your lungs will explode. Just let it out slowly, a little at a time, one continuous stream. Understand, I don't know enough about space or biology to know if any of this checks out, but I also don't really care. This is kind of an exciting climax to the book, so I'll take what I can get, you know? How long can a human survive in space without a suit, she asks. 90 seconds, but don't worry, we only need to make it 30. I hit the comms panel on the wall and give the order. Open the door, Cole. Do it now. I close my mind around the outer hull, locking it tightly in place. Behind us, the crates and debris from inside the ship have been pushed away from us by the pressure of the atmosphere leaving the Oraxis, but they're still traveling through hyperspace at a constant speed. You know what? Sure. Out of the corner of my eye, something snags at my attention. Reza! She's no longer strapped into her harness. She's grasping hold of the bench, her hands white with the effort, her body stretching out toward the open cargo door. Jas! Her voice is frantic inside my head. The harness snapped. I can't hold on. Well, for God's sake, Reza. I thrust out my other hand, grappling hold of Reza with my mind. It's now like a comedy of errors. Jas is still holding his breath. He's trying to track the med scanner's location. He's holding on to Reza with the force and physically holding the entire ship together with his mind. It happens very quickly. I have hold of her in my mind one second, and then she's being ripped away from me. I don't even see the container tearing free from the wall and hurtling toward her. I jump as the large metal lockbox crashes into Reza's body, sending her flying from my grasp out into hyperspace. Oh my god, I didn't realize I was kind of rooting for their love until ten different things were trying to kill them simultaneously. Reza's perspective. I managed to keep myself from expelling the remainder of my oxygen as I heard a lot of the open cargo doors. And I'm just sitting here like, has it not been 90 seconds yet? I am going to die and the very last thing I see burned into the very foundations of my soul is the look of horror on Jas's face. He's on his feet and moving before I can blink. His hand is reaching out to me, his fingers splayed, his eyes shining bright with determination. His boots are planted firmly on the deck of the Oraxis's cargo bay. His clothes flap and snap around him and his hair swirls and dances around his face, but his body remains locked in place, unmoving and strong. That's actually a cool visual. Put that one in the trailer for sure. I can't hold my breath anymore. Against all odds, I mean pulled back toward the Oraxis. I don't think I'm going to make it though. I don't think I can. My lungs are screaming for oxygen. I need to take a breath. I'm almost at the mouth of the cargo hold when I notice how badly Jas is shaking. He's fighting harder than I've ever seen him fight before. He's trying to save me. He's still keeping the ship from splintering apart in hyperspace. Yeah. Yeah, he's presumably holding the crates in space, mm -hmm. and he's also holding himself in place too, rooting himself to the deck. His grip on me loosens and Jas slides forward, his boots skidding across the grating three feet closer to the open cargo doors. He's not going to be able to save himself and me and the damage to the Nexus. Blow the crates, I tell him. And this now. Now? You're like five seconds from the door. I'm not blowing anything until you're back on the ship. Do the right thing, Jas. It's time. Just take my energy. You'll be strong enough to face the construct on your own. I lower the shields that have protected me from him. I let them fall. And it's the last thing I do. Yeah, I guess Reza just died in front of us. I feel like the description of the action and the pacing of this climactic scene are so much more polished and good than the entire rest of the book. It, it definitely seems like this was imagined and written first, and then the rest of the book had to be written around it to get them here. I actually feel a bit cheated when I can see how the author is capable of writing, when she's not bogged down by trying to re-explain Star Wars to me to justify her fanfic. Because, like, to be honest, I've really enjoyed these last couple chapters. They're flowing very nicely, some good visuals, some real tension. Anyway, I think we have, like, a dozen pages left, so let's keep at it. Oh, I'm sorry to pause there. I hope I'm not stressing you guys out. I, I highly doubt that Reza just actually died. Reza's mind shuts down and opens itself to me all at once. The energy inside me acts of its own accord, reaching out for the energy that exists within her, and the two threads of power twine together, twisting into one unbreakable rope, feeding back into me. Reza's body flies back toward the Oraxis, crashing through the cargo doors. As soon as she clears the open secondary airlock, I access the ship's systems and the heavy steel doors slam closed. 
Get ready to cut the hyperdrive, I shout. So now we're back in business. It actually did work to give him a lot of power. I cast out my mind hunting for the med scanner. It only takes a thought to create the spark I need. The Oraxis lurches, surging forward. So he ignites the crates with his mind and then they cut the hyperdrive. So they drop out of hyperspace, but the explosion is happening in hyperspace. So it only affects the enemy ship, I think. We made it. Cole sounds even more shocked than I am. I'm by Braze's side in the blink of an eye, fingers searching for a pulse in her throat. Her skin is ashen, her lips tinged a worrying shade of blue. Her skin is as cold as ice. Okay, I think I was wrong. I think Reza actually appears to be dead, so sorry. If she dies, I will be true to my word. I will travel the length, breadth, and width of the galaxy until there isn't a single life form left breathing. I will exact my infinite grief on everyone I find. This is my reservation about redemption arcs explicitly tied to romance stories. If you redeem someone with your love, I guess that's cute, but if that person tells you in no uncertain terms that you are his one tenuous link to redemption and that if anything happens to you, he's going to go out into the galaxy on an indiscriminate murder spree, that kind of sounds like you failed to redeem him, and that's not a happy story. I can't keep a hold on it anymore. I mentally cut the ropes I've been trying to lash the power down with, and it surges out of me like a river of white light. It strikes again, and this time it hits Raze's lifeless body. Something clicks in my head. This is how it was meant to be, how it was always meant to be. One person isn't strong enough to house the entirety of a force like this. Reza and I are counterweights, balancing each other out. Slowly, the darkness that claimed Reza's mind begins to retreat, pulling back inch by inch. Jas! I open my eyes and Cole's face is in mine, urgency contorting his features. I hate to interrupt, but the Nexus, it wasn't destroyed, not totally. They just dropped out of hyperdrive. You thought the book was over, but just like Reza, its lifespan has been unnaturally prolonged. Okay, so they make it to the moon they were heading toward, but then the construct starts firing on them, and now the ship is failing. Too late for emergency measures. Prepare for impact, Jas says. We'll separate from the ship as soon as we're lower than 4,000 feet. And then the eject feature fails, so they're not going to eject. Just everything is failing. And then we also find out that Jas can't help them with his force powers because they have arbitrarily been drained by the quantum of stuff he did with them before. There is no gravity on Archimedes, none whatsoever. The Nexus can fly all the way down to the surface. They'll be landing right on top of us. Gods, why did you bring us here, Jas? This was the worst idea possible. Jas's eyes have glossed over. He looks distant, strange. This was as good a place as any. Regis would have caught up with us no matter what, no matter how far we ran or where we ended up. We'll be able to set down and surrender without anyone else losing their lives. Sorry, it says losing their lives. I was taken out of the twist by another typo. Cole stops moving. He looks like he's just been stung. By what? Some kind of blood wasp? You brought us here so we could give ourselves over to the construct? The Oraxis slows smoothly as Jas lowers the controls, pushing them in and down to manage our landing. His actions are calm and confident, unhurried, as if he was never struggling to control the ship in the first place, as if... I shiver, horror crawling over my skin, as if he was in perfect control all along. No! This is the problem with you people, he says stiffly. You keep telling me how good I am, that I'm better, but the problem is I'm not. I'm exactly who I am and have always been. Jas Balar. I'm the bad guy, Reza, and bad guys do bad things. Jas must have been hurt earlier when he was fighting to pull me back in from hyperspace. A trail of blood runs from his temple down the side of his cheek. He wipes at it with the back of his hand, frowning at the scarlet smear that stains his skin. I thought we were going to be subjected to another long paragraph about how he looks hot like that, but I guess now is not the time. Jas's head kicks to the right when I slap him. You lied to me back there on those sand dunes. You said you were going to try and help us, and you knew all along you were going to do nothing of the sort. You're rotten, right down to your very core. There's nothing inside of you but a black, bottomless, cold, dark hole. A black moon rising, if you will. In the distance, in front of the research facility, the construct soldiers have formed into ranks and are marching toward the Oraxis with worrying speed. At the front of their column, a single tall figure leads, gold panels glinting off his shoulders. His face mask is striped with two panels of gold down its sides, singling him out as a general. 
General Stryker. My blood runs cold in my veins. And now for the first time I've learned that they wear masks. Huh. I knew you were rebellious, but your defiance knows no bounds, Jas Balar. Stryker spits. He hits a button on the side of his face mask, and the entire thing splits open concertinating together until it slides down into the steel-rimmed collar around his neck. Stryker grins at me like he's just run into an old friend. Well, hello there. What an unexpected surprise. Stryker used to be her commanding officer when she was still at the construct. I don't remember if I mentioned that. It low-key doesn't make sense because Stryker also personally oversaw Jass's training, which we were told was um, separate and very intense and presumably took a lot of time. Like, couldn't the author have just written them both separate trainers? Is the construct that small? Because, like, their paths rarely crossed as children and they were both in full-time training, so, like, how does this check out? Was it not full-time training? Is the construct just like middle school? You have like a 40-minute block of training with Stryker every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Is Stryker just the space equivalent of like a really mean pre-algebra teacher? Regis is going to be overjoyed when he realizes he has two runaways to play with. Stryker grunts. Should I reread that? Is like, <laughs> I'm hoping he'll let me take care of you, though. He pushes her forward, sending her sprawling onto the floor. She lands in a heap in front of the gathered scientist all one of them, I guess, who all recoil away from her like she's a venomous snake. Snakes in space. Snake, 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 snake. Just let me have this, you guys. I'm calm, cool, and collected on the outside. I've been gathering information. I've found out where they're based, where they've been hiding for decades. We can give the information to Regis together. You must think I'm completely stupid, Balar. If you had that kind of information, you would have transmitted it to the elders immediately. The place was a dead zone, I answer. It was impossible to get a message out. Stryker frowns, muttering under his breath. If you're telling the truth, you won't mind sharing the name of this planet, Balar. I hand it over without thinking twice. Pirius. The planet's name is Pirius. No! Raises cry of anguish bounces across the research facility's high ceiling arrivals area. Jess, you're going to get them all killed. You've just signed their death warrants. Way to, like, confirm the location, Reza. Reza looks at me, her eyes burning with hatred. I really feel it this time. She doesn't answer me when I say her name in my head. She doesn't say a word. I extend myself down the length of the connection, and I don't reach her until I hit the very end of it. Reza, you're the worst actresses in the world. Wow, all of them? I didn't mean for this to happen, I tell her. This is all italicized, he's saying it in their heads. And I didn't want to hurt you, but I had to in order to make this believable. I've told you before, haven't I? You're terrible at hiding your feelings. If I told you what I was planning, you'd never have agreed. You'd never have been able to keep the pretense up. You know what? They did set up earlier that he knows she's a bad liar. So I'm gonna give major props for the first instance in this book of setting something up a little while before you needed to know it. When the Nexus dropped out of hyperspace, I heard Regis's thoughts. He'd been learning how to defend his mind the way you and I can for a long time now. Wait, what? But he let his guard down for a moment. He didn't just get me hooked on the light when the construct took me. He also embedded a tracker into my genetic coding. What? Regis couldn't track me to Pirius, Reza. The sandstorms blocked out the tracker's transmission. What? But once we hit open space, it began transmitting again. There's no way to pull it from me. There's no way to remove it from my body. It's a part of me now. Regis will always know where to find me. What? So you hand me over to them once and for all? Reza answers. That's how you solve the problem? I'm going to activate the night creeper Darius gave me. I'm going to end this. Yeah, who, hey, wait a second. Oh my god. So Jas has decided to do a fake double cross where he hands Reza over to the construct, her biggest fear, when he knows she is equipped with a cyanide capsule that she's fully willing to use at any moment. And he just decides to not tell her about the plan because that's not a liability. And now also, 10 minutes later, he's telling her anyways. So why didn't you just tell her? No, Reza, no, no, don't do that. I have a plan. I'll have you out of here before anyone can lay a finger on you. I hope she can hear the sincerity in my voice. Yeah, me too. This could go south really fast if she doesn't believe you. I'll make sure the Pyrians are safe too. I had to give Stryker something, otherwise this would have never worked. The people of Pyrrhus are ready for revolution anyway. Varen's a murderer. He doesn't care about the people. He only cares about himself. He killed Cole's mother. We both know he's the one who- He didn't kill Erica, I say quickly. 
I looked into his mind on the night he won the election. Uh, okay, more stuff we weren't privy to, even though we were in his point of view when this happened. He didn't know who harmed the previous chancellor. I accidentally slipped into someone else's mind that night too, Reza. The person who really did commit the murder. What? I've been keeping this to myself for too long now. It's been weighing on me far more than I thought it would. Darius. Darius killed Erica. What? You're out of your mind, she hisses, even though that entire sentence has no sibilant sounds. She asked him to do it. She saw what was coming, and she knew the people needed to be unified. She thought her death would be a catalyst for change. Well, she succeeded in bringing an evil dictator into power, so good job, Erica. I send her my memories of Darius's thoughts. The scenes are blurry and confusing in places, but the final moments are very clear. Darius holding Erica in his arms, kissing the inside of her wrist and stroking her hair, then thrusting the ceremonial blade up into her stomach. She didn't scream, she didn't cry out. She held Darius's hand and spoke to him in hushed tones until she couldn't speak anymore and then Darius wept over her body until she went cold. Well, I guess now we know why the letters were so long, at least. Tears streaked down Reza's face, out of control. How am I going to tell Cole? Um, let me be real with you, Reza. You definitely shouldn't tell Cole. Concentrate, Reza. Stryker needs to see that you hate me. Cole's head is hanging, his body so limp that I begin to wonder if one of the soldiers knocked him out when I wasn't paying attention. Or maybe he went to sleep. That's a thing that happens in this universe, as we've seen. He raises his gaze a second later, though, perfectly conscious and apparently desperate to rip my insides out. My mother, she was wrong about you. You were supposed to be our savior, Jas. You were supposed to be my friend. Instead, you're going to be the damnation of the entire Commonwealth. You were the chosen one! It was said that you would destroy this sin, not join them! Bring balance to the force! Not leave it in I look around, surveying the gathered soldiers until I find what I am looking for. You, I say, pointing at one of the men guarding Reza. Give me those. The guard looks down at his waist, where I'm pointing, and fumbles to pull out his gloves. He offers them to me with shaking hands. I ignore him and slide my hands inside the black leather, closing my fists one at a time to stretch them out. Next, I remove the helmet from the soldier's head. Reza's eyes are wide and filled with tears as I slide the helmet down over my head, obscuring my face in what feels like a very final kind of way. I, we got all the way to the last page and I got what I wanted. He's wearing a helmet. I was never your friend, fool. And yes, damnation I will be. I will help murder them all and when Pyrrhus is gone, I will scour the galaxy until every last Commonwealth fighter base is destroyed. But don't worry, you will be long dead by then. I stand and give him a stiff salute. One life, Kolpaka. One duty. One construct. Okay, and that's the end of the book. Surprise, there's definitely going to be a sequel, but I think we kind of knew that going in. So that was Black Moon Rising. This book was published in January of 2018, only one month after The Last Jedi's release. For that reason, our two romantic leads having a force bond type connection is very curious to me. On one hand, the force bond connection is a major part of the story. It couldn't have been added as a late revision. It seems pretty entwined throughout. So like, yeah, maybe it's fair to just chalk this up to one big quint Incidents. It just happens to be a lot like the Star Wars sequel trilogy, but it happens in the genre. On the other hand, fan fiction does have a famously quick turnover rate, and when you're online self-publishing, there's basically no gap in time between writing and publication, so you could get this out pretty quickly. Besides, Force Bonds as a concept have existed in the Star Wars Expanded Universe for a pretty long time, and like, let's not pretend they've never been followed to the romantic conclusion. I'm of course referring to Yoda and Count Dooku. No, I'm just kidding. Bastila Shan and Darth Revan were like the most obvious example of that. Actually, okay, let's do an experiment. I am gonna look for Raylo fanfic predating The Last Jedi using a force bond. I am going to assume that I will find at least two dozen. Rey and Kylo Ren. Um, I could search the phrase, but force bond does have its own tag. Force bondage, come on you guys. Although, no, I guess we had that in the book too. And then there's date updated. So I'm gonna set a custom window so it's nothing that's even been updated since before um, 
I'll do December 1st of 2017. And that gives us... 363 fanfics. Okay, so yes, I think we can safely say that this idea was in the public consciousness before The Last Jedi came out. So I'm gonna go ahead and cross that off our list. Not a coincidence. You're probably wondering what the author's deal is and there's not a lot of tea to spill there. Frankie Rose is a pen name for Callie Hart. All of her work is self-published and I believe all of it is either digital or print on demand, but she is a USA Today best-selling author. It's weird because the fact that this is a pen name and that it's really Callie Hart is reiterated all over the product description, in the about the author, and it's like, why use a pen name? Hmm. All of her other books appear to be romance novels about brooding, dark, alpha male heroes who need to be redeemed by the heroine. So it's not like this is really a break from formula. So, hmm, why separate out this one? That's, that's so strange. Uh, this isn't like a call out video. And this isn't an invitation for you guys to go leave negative reviews on Amazon. I've seen Amazon after I do these book reviews and I know what you guys do. You can't leave a review for a book you didn't read, okay? It's embarrassing. It makes you look like you can't judge books for yourself and you're gonna get the books taken down off Amazon, you guys. And then nobody gets to read them. I'm not here to kill these books. I catch them put a little tag on their ear and I release them back into the wild. There are some good character beats, some funny dialogue exchanges and solid banter. And even though the pacing was criminally out of whack, I really did like the ending. It was very cinematic. It had a lot of tension to it. It was well described. It's possible with all the sloppily handled groundwork out of the way, the sequel will actually be good. Although I am a little salty that she didn't at least like proofread it once before putting it up for sale. Like if you're gonna charge me $14, at least read it a second time. There's even a typo on the back of the book. It like, it has the whole summary. And then at the bottom it says, coming January 16th, 2018. It says that on the physical book. Like she just took the copy of her blurb and copy pasted it onto the back without looking at it again. But anyway, I don't hate this book and I don't even actually care that it's stealing from Star Wars. Yeah, I said it. I think Disney is gonna be fine, you guys. So what was the point of this exercise? Entertainment, obviously. Secondly, I just think a published copy of a fanfic is such an interesting little curio to have and I'm excited to put it on my shelf. I'm like a non-force user that keeps a bunch of holocrons in my creepy collection. The heroes of an animated Star Wars series have to interact with me for exactly one episode to get the fanfic off my hands and then I never appear again. But there is a bigger picture. I thought this was a good opportunity to talk a little on the topic of publishing fanfiction. We've seen a huge rise in this in recent years. Obviously, Fifty Shades of Grey is the big one that started as a Twilight fanfic, but we also have the Mortal Instruments series, which allegedly began as a Draco Malfoy fanfic, and after a One Direction fanfic is getting a movie adaptation later this year, and which, yes, you guys really want me to read after, and maybe. I did order the book, so I might do that. Adapting fanfic for publication and sale is this morally gray area. Morally Fifty Shades of Grey. But like in Fifty Shades, at least it was an alternate universe fanfic. Like, she took the characters and a lot of the plot elements in a vague sense, but they weren't also vampires. Black Moon Rising is like if Fifty Shades of Grey got published, but Christian Grey was also a vampire, and Jose was also a werewolf, and they also go to Italy and fight a council of vampires, and just the BDSM stuff is happening peripheral to all that. So in other words, a much better book. But let's even ignore all of that. The primary thing that suffers when you publish a fanfic as a new novel is obviously the story of the novel. In fanfic, since you're using an existing work as a springboard, you don't have to bring the entire lore of the universe to the table. You just open it up with the characters and they're ready to go and everyone understands what's going on. This was well addressed in the Fifty Shades series on the Folding Ideas channel, which um, I will, the eye thing, I'll, I'll link it, it goes right there. Then you can click the link. So anyway, the audience already understands the universe, the character dynamics, and if you're writing something where you really just care about the character interactions, like say a romance, you can just jump right into the parts that you actually want to write. In a book like this, 
where it is adapted into an original work, but it's not totally divorced from the content it started as. You have all this tiresome exposition, over explaining things, making them make less sense because you need them to not sound too similar. And all that stuff detracts from space that could be used to establish the characters, show them interacting more, and make us understand why they're in love, which is important in a romance. Jas and Reza are in love. Why? They don't even like each other. They're on opposite sides of a conflict. The author wants to have a sexy dynamic where like they're adversaries, but they also love each other and are attracted to each other, but it's not built up enough to work. If it's a Raylo fanfic, the amount of explanation you need is the events of The Force Awaken happened and also Kylo Ren is attracted to Rey. That's it. And people know where they're going from there. We don't know Jas or Reza, and they haven't apparently interacted much before the events of the book, so there's not a lot to work with. Or I guess I should say they've interacted in person maybe three times, but they've been having mind dates for like seven years, and I guess maybe during that time is when they fell in love, but we didn't get to see any of that. How are we supposed to invest in this relationship? And Reza doesn't remember any of that, and Jas does remember it all, but he doesn't act like he's in love. We even have a lot of inner monologues when he's on his way to Perius, where he's thinking he doesn't know what he's going to do when he gets there. Maybe he'll hand Reza over to the construct. That doesn't sound like a man in love. And it's like, really? You remember everything, buddy. Like, from your experience, that's basically just your girlfriend. So are they in love or aren't they? Reza gets her memories back, but she still resents Jas. But why does she resent Jas? Ray hates Kylo Ren because he murdered all her friends. Reza hates Jas for working for the construct, but he only does that because he's been brainwashed since he was a kid and Reza was subjected to the same brainwashing, so you'd think she'd be sympathetic. And, by the way, she broke out of the brainwashing because of puberty, which I guess Jazz never went through. All things considered, he did okay for himself. Removed from the exact context they were obviously written in, the characters' motivations make no sense anymore. The author did this to herself. It's obvious that when she wrote the fanfic, it was deeply entrenched in the universe in which it was set, which is a good quality for a fanfic, but it also means that you can't extract it without breaking it. Reza and Jas are mentally connected because Rey and Kylo Ren are mentally connected. But because there's no force, the explanation for the mental connection becomes that stupid thing about planet Earth that made no sense. And from a story perspective, the mental link didn't really accomplish all that much. So what? You remove the mental connection. But you can't. Rey and Kylo Ren have shared experiences beyond their mental connection. But those shared experiences are the events of The Force Awakens, so you can't have those in your book. But if you had to cut the events of The Force Awakens, you can't cut the mental connection because it's literally all you have left. Like, what else would you have? They, they went to space middle school together? Going from being enemies to being in love is a pretty significant change, so if that's what your aim is, you need to really hustle to make it work. But instead, Jas and Reza just go from zero to completely devoted within, like, 30 pages at the end of the story. And instead of fixing that and fleshing it out a little more, valuable page length is wasted, basically reiterating the entirety of Star Wars canon with different names. If you're going to be this overt about lifting a universe, honestly, at this point, it would be better if the narration just said, it's basically Star Wars. I mean, if this universe has cliff notes, they probably have Star Wars. You could just have Jas remark in his internal monologue, like, gee, this universe and the events of my life are a lot like Star Wars. I remember watching it on my home planet Earth, where everybody had telepathic powers. And then you've just saved me from having to read like 60% of the book. I'm not trying to knock fanfic, I think it can be a very useful tool for authors. It can be great practice for a beginning writer who just wants to start writing a story but is intimidated maybe by world building. It can be a great way for an aspiring author to slide into an existing fandom, establish their own fan base and then go write original works and actually have people buy them. Or it can be a fun place for already established authors to just show up and play around with some ideas purely out of the joy of writing and interacting with the community. But your fanfic can't be your book. I mean, evidently it can, but it shouldn't. I mean, I guess if you really want it to be, I can't stop you and it'll be a major motion picture this year. Actually, I hope this is just the way of the future. I want every published work to be easily traceable back to its extremely famous source material. Avatar 2 is going to come out and we're going to immediately realize that one of the characters 
is obviously a Navi version of Captain America, and his love interest is obviously a Navi version of the Winter Soldier. They just happen to be avatars, and they're dating. I hope we get to see a Black Moon Rising movie, and I hope Frankie Rose gives us a sequel. I would like to know about the continued adventures of Jas and Reza, and Cole, and Darius, and Ch Chancellor Farron, and General... General Regis. I'll probably buy it. I'm sufficiently hooked. And I want to see the scene on the casino planet where our heroes free the blood horses. Also, in the interest of my Trap and Release Fanfic Wildlife Foundation, I thought I would buy several more copies of the book and give them out to you guys. So, you know, the author is benefiting in some way. At the time of recording, I have never done an Amazon giveaway before and I have no idea how they work. But um, if you've stuck around this long, just uh, check the description or maybe I'll put text up. I think it's like random. I think if you just click a link and you're like the 300th person, it'll tell you if you want. And finally, I would like to thank Black Moon Rising for sponsoring this video. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Can you imagine though? No, but uh, okay, bye.